Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Um, week four, thermodynamics, lecture A. Um, I, I think the lectures become more interesting from now. So uh, we started off with some revision of ideal gases and thermodynamic processes. Last week we had a big what if your substance isn't an ideal gas week. And this week we start talking about what type of machines work with the working fluids we've talked about. So we've defined ideal gases, we've defined pure substances, we've worked a little bit with them, we've read some tables. Now we're saying, all right, what are we doing with these? So shaft work machines, throttles, nozzle diffusers, mixes chambers, um, and heat exchangers. And then we put these together in cycles and we say, all right, let's go through a type of mixing chamber we'll call a boiler, then we'll go through a shaft work machine called a turbine, we'll go back to a mixing chamber called a condenser, maybe a heat exchanger called a condenser, and then back into a pump, boom, steam power. So we need to get these components and then we'll do assembled cycles. So start to talk about, I think, what is exciting and interesting um, and trying to get into the meat of the subject. Sorry it's taking until week four to get there. Um, let's do a quick little review. So what did we talk about last time we were together? We had a one hour lecture on Wednesday in Rex Vowles. Uh, we finished off talking about thermodynamic property tables. I should just mention something because I didn't mention it and I'll trip you up. Um, we formally introduced quality and then we did some interpolation stuff. That was all reinforced by problem solving session three. So, um, you know, like when we do an exam, I'm not going to test you on multiplication because I just assume you can do it. Interpolation is one of those things that you just need to get right. You need to get it 100% right every time and do it quickly um, because I won't mark you on it, but you'll need it in order to find the solution to the problems. Actually, quiz one might have some just real interpolation stuff. So quiz one might, <clears throat> I haven't written it yet, that's this afternoon's job. Um, might just do interpolate this, but it's much more likely to be, here's a process, interpolation is required at both ends, and you need to do the interpolation right to get it right. Um, so just a little thing about that. There was something I didn't mention for property tables that I should have and will now do. Two things, one is um, I can reproduce up to 10% of a textbook or, um, or one chapter, whichever is greater for educational purposes. So in week three lecture, I've got a section, a page called uh, tables for reference. And if we go there, I've reproduced uh, the water tables from Rysel and also refrigerant R12 and refrigerant 134A from Rogers and Mayhu, which I think are the tables that you are most required to use. I think uh, some of the questions also mention ammonia um, for Rogers and Mayhu, but that's, that's there. I just wanted to make a comment about um, saturation values at low values of compression because, which I should have mentioned last week, um, sorry about that. So the question would arise, what's the, God bless you, what's the properties of compressed liquid water at atmospheric pressure, so like current atmospheric pressure, at, for example, 45 degrees. So say we had, so we've got a temperature of 45 degrees where the, the saturation pressure then, so the pressure required to make it boil is, call it 10 kilopascals, all right? We're not at 10 kilopascals, we're at atmospheric pressure, okay? All we've got, and the question is, you've got a whole bunch of properties along here, blah, blah, blah. All you've got, atmospheric pressure, which is there. So here we've faithfully represented the pressure that we're at. Here we've faithfully represented the temperature that we're at. And so should we use these values or should we use those values? Not an uncommon question, and one that I didn't discuss um, and should have talked about. 
We shouldn't use 45 degrees, we should use 40, sorry. Because when I, let's use 40. That way there's no interpolation. Cool. So should we use those values, should we use those values? And indeed we've got fluid values and, va oh, liquid values and vapor values, as we know, okay? And the, the answer is that we use the values defined by the temperature rather than the values defined by the pressure. And the reason for that is that in the liquid form, these values are much more sensitive to changes in temperature than they are to changes in pressure, okay? And so just to evidence that, say we were interested in the enthalpy, that's pretty common, we're interested in the enthalpy, all right? Say we've got the enthalpy at 7.3 kilopascals, so this is quite rarefied, and 40 degrees C is 167.5. Can someone remember 167? Good. Let's go down to the compressed liquid tables. Compressed liquid tables. All right. If we compressed it all the way to 5 megapascals, so we've gone from 7 kilopascals to 5 megapascals, we've had a massive change of pressure, Okay, but at the same temperature, the enthalpy is 170. All right, so what was that? That's five in 100. So it's gone up about, oh, it's 550. So it's gone up about 4%, okay? By going through a pressure change of a factor of a few thousand, okay? But, right, so, so small percentage change, small error um, for a large pressure difference. But if we looked at the temperature values, let's go up here. All right, you can see that at 100 degrees, it's going to, enthalpy was what we we're tracking, it's going to 420. Okay, so the temperature value is um, much less representative. Okay, the true value will be somewhere between 167.5 and 172, and you can interpolate that. At one atmosphere, it'll be 100. 68, you know, whatever. It'll, um, but it won't be materially different from that value. So that's why. So um, this is one of those, you pick the value that's closest. So rather than interpolating, you just pick the value that works. Um, that works up to, I would use that up to two and a half megapascals of pressure, right? By the time something was at four megapascals of pressure, maybe you want to interpolate between this pressure and the five megapascal, because that's your first data point. You say, all right, well, it's 80% of the way towards that value. Now it's not 167, now it is 170 and a half. You know, so maybe you want to start interpolating then. Um, so just a comment on compressed liquid that's at low values of compression, one atmosphere, two atmospheres, three atmospheres. Um, use the saturation values for the liquid side. There you go. Good. All right, good, good. There was a question about interpolating superheated tables. Let's find something that's reasonable. Uh, and the question was, it's about two-dimensional interpolation. Uh, that'll do. Cool. All right, so can I, can I put some numbers on your question to try and rephrase it? So say, for example, you had a pressure of 4.2 MPa and you had a uh, temperature of, so let's call it pressure equals, and a temperature of, so let's say 425 degrees C, okay? So 425 isn't here, and 4.2 is neither four nor, nor four and a half. That's your question. So how do you interpolate on a superheated steam table when you've got a pressure and a temperature and neither of them are in the, ta in the thing? Uh, let's say you want to find enthalpy, just so we've got one, one value that we're focusing on. And the enthalpy row is this row. In the book, there's no headings on the second page. It opens up to a two to a page and there's no headings. Okay, good. So this is the values that we want because this is enthalpy H. Cool. So the answer is you need to interpolate what ends up being three times. And that's okay, it's just a, it's just a process. And I will when I'm defining problems, try and avoid that because no one likes spending hours doing this. Um, 
So the first thing you do, uh, and what have you got? So you need that one and you need this one. Cool. The first thing you do is you've got a H for 400 degrees C and a H for 450 degrees C. You create a new point, which is H at 425 degrees C at four megapascals. And I pick 425 because it's midway between. What's 215, what's the average of 215 and 330? It feels like about 285, right? So we'll get something that's 3285. I made that up. You should use a calculator, right? 3285. Then you need a value within the 4.5 megapascal range for 425 which is the average of those two numbers, average of 205 and so that'd be 200 and 320 is the difference. So that would be 3265 nominally, right? And so now you've got H at 425 degrees C at 4.5 MPA, okay? So now you've got a value for that. Let's use a different color. Red's getting to me. Okay, good. Green's more positive. You've got a value for that. You've got a value for that. They're down here. And now you interpolate between those two values. So this is at 4.0 megapascals. This is at 4.5 megapascals. What you want is something that's 4.2 megapascals, which is 20% of the way, no, 40% of the way, because it's only half. 40% of the way between that and that. And look at that. There's only 20 the difference. 40% of 20 is 8. So it will be 3, 2, 7, 7, or something similar. Yeah, good, excellent. Um, good question, glad you asked. I'd kind of briefly mentioned two-dimensional interpolation, but I don't think we did an example of it. Um, and the application of it to superheat was a good question. Any other questions reviewing material from last week? I appreciate that, yeah, go. With interpolation, UNSW approved calculators have a function for interpolation. It's not really faster. So you enter the values in and say. It's just like a table. Okay. Brilliant. All right, good. If your calculator has that, use it. Um, I won't be assessing working if you get the right answer in the exam. So if your answer is correct, then you'll get the marks irrespective of your working. If your answer is not correct, then I'll look at your working to see what you did. If you have no working, you can receive no marks. So from a marks perspective, that's good, but use it enough that you know how to use it, that you do it right. Otherwise, write some working down. That's a good hint. Excellent. Let's talk about thermodynamic components. Oh, no. First, some maths. Um, cool, we've done the first law for closed systems. Now we're talking about the first law for open steady state systems. So we should talk about what, what's the steady state assumption, what does steady state mean? Uh, we should relook at our conservation laws in light of the steady state assumption and then define a mathematical, this is the first law for steady state, um, steady flow systems. So generally when we're designing the operating condition of a plant or a process, power plant, whatever, um, generally we design for steady state, steady flow. Um, uh, just out of interest, when you're designing a footbridge, generally you design for the fully constructed condition, how bad was that collapse during construction? So you need to design for every point along the way it's not just good enough that when the whole thing's assembled, it'll work. It needs to work along the way as well. Um, that also works with our systems in a thermodynamic sense. Right? Is that time? Um, you want to design something that runs efficiently and well in a steady state operating condition, but also runs at least reliably on the way towards steady state. So it's not just good enough if it works when it's hot. Um, it also has to work on the way to heating up. But once it's there and it's what we'll consider, we say things are steady state and steady flow. 
So this means that over the period of our observation, so after run up and before cool down, the properties don't change with time. So properties, so this is the temperature at a location, the specific enthalpy at a location, those sorts of things. Um, and if there's mass flow, that also doesn't fluctuate. So the mass flow doesn't change with time. Uh, using an early analogy, the bathtub isn't filling up or emptying, it's maintaining its level. Um, yeah, how long does it take, or which is faster? Okay, this is, so this is something that's coming out of um, South Australia into the public conscience, so I feel like you should know. Um, which is faster to start up, a steam power plant or a um, gas turbine power plant? By what kind of factor? Same. Same? Ten times it's longer, I think. Don't know. No, nah, it's less than hundred. Somewhere in there. But I think I think gas turbine. I think they were saying in, in South Australia that they can respond in about six minutes with a gas turbine system. Um, I think st to achieve steady state for steam, you can take like half a day. Um, Achieving steady state with a calcine used to take like a day and a half, like two days. So you'd turn it on, it would warm up and it would hiccup and muck around. So um, during that time, you're not having good, and of course the attraction, sorry, the South Australian tie-in, was the attraction of a battery is it can respond in functionally real time with, um, with network demands. Uh, we'll see what the new government has to say about that. So during your startup period, you're still putting energy in, you're paying the capital cost on the equipment, um, but you're not getting good product, um, good production out of it, that represents a cost. And so for a lot of these sort of machines, we like to keep them running all the time. Um, yes, let's leave that. Good. Conservation. So what does conservation of mass and conservation of energy look like in an environment where we're at steady state and steady flow? Conservation of mass, we said that mass into the system minus mass out of the system must equal a change of mass in the system over time, okay? And so if there's no change in mass in the system over time, the mass into the system must equal the mass out of the system. All right, and there's, there's a summation here because you have lots of inlets and or lots of outlets. Um, you can't have only inlets or outlets and achieve steady state. And I just want to put some things down here around how mass flow rate can be represented. So mass flow rate can be density times volumetric flow rate. Uh, it can be volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. That's just using density as a reciprocal of specific volume. Um, volumetric flow rate can also be the area times by the velocity. Okay, and so I've, I've pulled that over to the right. We're going to use that relationship later. But if you, anyone done 2600 or a fluids course? Good, you've already done 2600, cool. Then you shouldn't be happy with me saying this. So this V here is velocity, okay? No strike through, that V there is velocity. You shouldn't be happy with that equation because you should know that towards the walls, a fluid will flow slower and towards the center of the pipe, the fluid will flow faster. So actually what we're interested in is integrating across the area, okay? the normal component of velocity times by the density at that point. So the density is inside the integral here, so I've got a compressible fluid. Units of mass flow rate. Mass flow rate. Kilograms per second. Kilograms per second, okay. Excellent, good. So what about conservation of energy? So that's conservation of mass, mass in, mass out. Cool, we'll see that. Conservation of energy. For our closed system, we kept the terms on the right of this equal sign and we got rid of the mass flow rate term on the left hand side because there's no mass flow, but the energy in the system can change. Now we're talking about something different. Now we're saying, okay, there is mass flow in and out of the system, but the internal energy, the velocity and the potential energy, the kinetic energy and the uh, potential energy aren't changing with respect to time. Whatever they are, they're staying where they are. And I've also changed work here. I've put a little S under here to note shaft work. Shaft work is generally what we care about in this subject. 
in a steady state, steady flow system, you can't have moving boundary work. Right? Moving boundary work is like a cylinder, you're compressing it and you're releasing it. Okay? That's something's changing with time. We're talking about something like a turbine where the casing is fixed and the shaft is turning. That's how you're getting work out of the system. Right? So typically you won't have moving boundary work to worry about. It'll be a, um, it'll be a shaft work term. So now we need to deal with the energy associated with mass flow. So before we just did internal energy, we'll talk about mass flow work. The energy associated with mass flow has two components. Okay, so when you've got uh, steam entering, hot air entering, liquid water entering your boundary, okay, you've got the mass flow times by the specific energy that that fluid brings with it. And the specific energy that fluid brings with it is the same construction as what was on the right hand side of our equation last when we did closed systems, right? So the specific, uh, the energy within that system will involve thermal energy, internal energy U, and it'll involve <laughs> kinetic energy, V squared on two, and it'll involve potential energy, okay? But your flow that's coming in is also bringing with it work associated with that flow. And the way you can think of this is that you've got pressure and velocity impacting over an area, okay? And so that's working on the fluid inside the boundary. Now, what's the flow work? So just coming off to the side, it's the force associated with the fluid times by the velocity, okay? We would say work equals F S, meaning displacement, but if we differentiate with respect to time on the left-hand side, we can differentiate with respect to time on the right-hand side, so we can say force times velocity. But the force of the fluid, the force the fluid can bear is the pressure of the fluid times the area is the total force, okay? And now we can use this relationship from a previous page that said m dot v equals av. And we pull that in and we say, well, our AV term is M dot specific volume. Bring mass out the front, and you've got mass flow rate times by the pressure of the fluid times by the specific volume of the fluid. So that's the work associated with the flow coming into or out of the system. Everyone happy with the... <laughs> That little manipulation, good, stretching, excellent. All right, now, because we've got a mass term here, mass flow rate term here and a mass flow rate term here, we can pull those out. Um, out of the bracket, we collect our internal energy and our pressure term, okay? And we see that this is our definition for enthalpy, that internal energy plus pressure times specific volume is our definition for enthalpy. And so we find that our energy associated with mass flow is enthalpy, which is a measure of the thermal internal energy and the pressure and specific volume that it brings with it. It's the kinetic energy and it's the potential energy. And my my question is, what's the significance of this term, right? How significant is that term? When will mass in equals mass out? Okay, so you've got like a single, single, in, single in, single out system, all right? Where the mass flow is the same, but the PV, P1, V1, or P in, V in, is very different to the P exit, V exit. So when is this term really significant. Uh, there's no change in pressure. Have a think about it. Wrestle with it. Convince yourself that there's a case where this works. Absolutely. Okay. When you're converting from a liquid to a gas, so say this was a boiler and what you had coming in was liquid water. Yep. Liquid water, right? So at 10 megapascal, you know, who cares? Pick, pick a pressure, right? 
So the pressure in is 10 megapascal, the pressure out is 10 megapascal. The volume in, the volume flow rate in, will be quite low, liquid water is quite dense, okay? And then if you boil that, and you've got vapor out, then your V exit term will be much larger than your VI term, okay? So change of phase particularly, we'll see large changes in, um, in this pressure term. So that's our flow rate in, and we've got flow rate in and flow rate out. So um, that can bring energy into the system or take energy out of the system. So our conservation of energy now looks like our heat transfers minus our work, um, work shaft work out, and our mass flow rate. So in general, you get the equation down the bottom. So you've got heats, works, plus energy associated with mass flow in minus energy associated with mass flow out equals the change of energy in the system with respect to time, which is zero. So this is our main equation. I think I've got it. There we are. Good, good. So I've got those up. So these are then our main equations, and we use these for all of our thermodynamic components. So this is the first law for open steady state systems. Steady state, steady flow open systems. Right? Generally, we can make a bunch of simplifications and we say, ah, velocity is not important in this case, potential energy is not important in this case, it's adiabatic, there's no Q term, you know, so you can simplify this down and we will, but it's not bad to know where the things come from initially and know what simplifications you're making. If you know what simplifications you're making, you can know whether they're reasonable to make or not. Um, so that's that. Uh, they're in purple. I put pur formulas in purple last year when I thought they were worth you memorizing them. This year, for the quizzes, I'm going to go through and grab the purple formulas and put them in a formula sheet because I said I want to provide a formula sheet for the quizzes. So that's an example of the formula you'll get and you'll have to make your own simplifications. Okay? That'll work. Cool. So oh, now basically the rest of today and probably tomorrow as well, is talking about devices that operate on this principle. So steady state, steady flow, open devices. Um, and I got some pictures. I think it's cool. I think it's a fun lecture. Um, were there any questions about the theory before we start talking about the rest of the stuff? Great, good. Cool. Shaft work machines. So we've got five classes of machines. Uh, and the first one is shaft work machines. And the thing in the bottom left it makes extensive use of shaft work machines, um, specifically a compressor at the front and a turbine at the back. So it's a turbofan jet engine. So we'll go through the first law again. We'll simplify it down. We'll talk about turbines. So turbines are what we use when we've got a compressible fluid and we're trying to get work out. A compressor is what we use when we've got a compressible fluid and we're trying to use work to create pressure. Uh, it also creates heat. A pump is what we use when we've got an incompressible fluid and we're trying to gen generate pressure, increase the pressure. Um, and then we'll ask the question, is there a fourth that which you use when you've got incompressible fluid and you're trying to get work out of the system? Um, and so we'll just address that. So this is a pretty typical question. Uh, how much power is produced from a turbine which processes, processes steam at 600 degrees C and a pressure of 50 bar. You should be comfortable with bar as well as megapascals, as well as atmospheres, however the pressure is given. Isentropically to one bar at a flow rate of a certain number of tons per hour. And how much power is required to raise the same mass flow rate of saturated waters between these pressures? So this is trying to get you thinking in terms of there's a boiler, and there's a condenser, there's a turbine, and there's a pump. So now we're saying, let's look at this turbine and see how much power it generates. Then let's look at this pump and see how much power it consumes. And we'll talk about the boiler and the condenser later. But our shaft work machines are our turbine and our pump. So this is a basic steam power plant. This is a basic Rankine cycle uh, steam power plant. So just kind of introducing the components and we'll get to the cycle. 
So this is our governing law from the previous, uh, previous concept. We've just carried it forward into this one. Cool. Let's make some assumptions. It's not always true. Uh, no, I should read them in order, sorry. So we'll say that the change in kinetic energy and potential energy is negligible compared to the change in thermal energy. So we did that example of throwing a bottle. Um, you we're talking in the percent, you know, in the single digit percent range, the kinetic energy and potential energy will have any effect at all. It's not always true that things are single input, single outlet, but we will let them be so for our simplified example. Um, particularly turbines will often have lots of offtakes. So you'll have a section of turbine, then you'll have an offtake, another section of turbine, another offtake. Um, but for this, we'll say single inlet, single outlet. Um, We'll deal with more complicated cases later. We'll say single heat gain or loss. So we'll get rid of the summation. We'll just say there's a Q term there. We'll say single shaft work input or output. So we'll just have a single work term. Um, because our mass in and our mass out are the same thing, we get rid of our subscripts on our mass. And because we get rid of kinetic energy and potential energy, we just get H in and H out. So with those simplifications in place, it simplifies the equation down the bottom. So Heat minus work, and these are all flow rate terms because we're steady state, steady flow. If you integrate over time, or say the process goes for one minute, then you can just times it by 60 to get a, an overall value. So heat minus work is mass flow rate, enthalpy in minus enthalpy, sorry, enthalpy out minus enthalpy in. Yeah, okay, I've taken the Q, Q and W terms over to the other side of the of the equation. So get that. So that's our, our math. Just worth noting, right? Shaft work machines, what we're, what we're really doing here is creating pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. So in a pump and a compressor, we've got a low pressure initially and a high pressure after the fact. For a turbine, we've got a high pressure initially and a low pressure after the fact. Okay, so we're, we're for a turbine, we're exploiting the pressure difference. Um, for a compressor and a pump, we're creating a pressure difference uh, using work. And the other thing is, if these operate in an ideal sense, they are isentropic. So the process they produce, if they're ideal, is isentropic. So a compressor will uh, heat up the gas as it compresses it. Um, because it's not doing it isothermally, it's doing it isentropically. So what does a turbine look like? Here's a couple of examples of large turbines. Are there any people in this? There's an arm in that photo just there. Up, oh, back. That's an arm just sticking out there. So these are large machines. Um, <laughs> The gas flow goes from, in this case, goes from the inside towards the outside. Okay, and in this case, the gas flow will go, oops, not there. Uh, it's got to be inboard of the bearing. It'll go there and towards the outside. So the gas is expanding as it goes through the turbine. Um, and so it's going from the small blades to the large blades. This is a compressor. Um, these are my photos. So this is taking air in here, All right, this is a filter, so that's a perforated, uh, perforated cloth. So dirty air on the inside, clean air on the outside, redirecting them to the inside. It's got something in here that spins, <coughs> called an impeller, and the impeller might have veins like that that force the air to the outside, and then that's going up and providing cooling air to a set of burners. That's a, um, that's a compressor. This is, um, well, this is an impeller. This is not the impeller for that fan. This is an impeller for a different fan. So you know how big a flatbed truck is. Um, so that's about 13 ton and 300 grand worth of impeller. Um, the, oops, uh-oh, that one. The veins are there. So that's where the veins are. This is where your inlet is. This is where your outlet is. 
Um, I'll show you the housing for that later. I've got a top-down photo of the housing that that sits in um, later on. Centripetal blowers are appropriate for medium pressures and large volumetric flow rates. So this um, particular fan is maintaining a pressure difference of uh, maybe 13 kPa. So, you know, about 15% about of an atmosphere, maybe, and it's quite a large diameter. They maintain higher pressure differences the larger the diameter and the faster they turn. Um, so it's only good for low pressure differences, um, or, or med that's called, would be called medium pressures. Um, when I was... So you guys do 2100 next, next session if you're doing a standard mechanical degree. Um, I was talking to someone in last session, they were doing 2100, they were designing uh, something and they wanted to pull, they had a foam ball, they wanted to pull it against a spring and then with a fan and then stop the fan and then the spring would push the foam ball out and like throw it, okay? So this is like a, um, like a tennis ball firing machine but with foam, okay? And they were using like a desk fan, yeah? It's like an axial fan. And I said, well, what kind of pressure are you expecting this fan to draw to, to pull the mechanical spring back? Um, and they didn't know. And that, you know, that, I think that's concerning. So um, you should have some sense of what kind of pressures different uh, constructions of fan can produce. None of this is strictly in the thermodynamics curriculum, but I think it's important to know. Um, and I think you look foolish if you don't consider it. So a desk fan is good for like a couple of pascals, right? You don't get, if you deadhead it, so if you put a desk fan, right, in a pipe and you block off the pipe and you run it and the question is what's the pressure in there? Okay, so that's your, your static head pressure. You're measuring very low values. If you deadhead this, you may be measuring 20 or 25 kilopascals. Um, we'll talk about, so this is again, so this is an axial com um, compressor. So this is more something you'd find in a, in a jet engine. Um, again, medium pressures, right? If you want to maintain large pressure differences, you use a rotary low blower. If this is the inlet and this is the outlet, my question is, which way does the top lobe um, rotate? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? Talk with your neighbour. Which way does the top lobe rotate? I'm going to show of hands, counterclockwise or anti-clockwise. Take 20 seconds. Convince the person next to you of what you think happens. All right, good, good. Did you disagree? Or did you, hang on, who, who disagreed? Just out of fun. Good. Who agreed? More people agreed than disagreed. Okay. Of the people who agreed, who said clockwise? I need to, I need to define for my own, right? A clock goes this way. So who says clockwise? Guys at the back, good. Okay, ready? Who says anti-clockwise? I'm calling that a 50-50 split, just based on the room. Cool, okay. Radio, let's draw this arrow a little bit neater. So, you think, because it's what you think, right? You think that air has to, well, it's just, the, it's the way, it's, I, th I think it's what, you look at this and you're like, air must travel through the middle. And so therefore, that will go around there and that'll push the air through the middle. 
and I'm not sure what this is all about. Okay? <laughs> right? These spaces are all about. What actually happens is, so there's very little gap. Well, actually, that, well, that's touching. You, you, you lap these down so they've got very tight clearances. Okay? You try and get this as close as you can. It doesn't touch, but there's very minimal clearance. What actually happens is, this top one goes this way. Okay? The air is trapped here. As it turns, it then goes over here. And then, as it turns, it's released into this space and goes there. Similarly, the air goes around the outside of the bottom one. Okay? What about this middle area? Well, as these lobes move this way, there's no space. They're squeezed together. There's no space for the air to get through. And so, in a rotary load blower, the air actually goes around the outside. And so, what does that mean? That means it travels clockwise. Give yourself a clap. Um, someone learned, well, at least half the class learned, learned something, right? Um, you get, uh, this is a type of blower, you get gear pumps, which are based on the same thing, but pump fluid, right? Positive displacement uh, devices. The reason that this can maintain high pressures is unlike, right, this compressor here, for example, right, if you've got a whole bunch of pressure here, it can weave its way back through, this is how I visualise it, it can weave its way back through the blades, right, and certainly it will hold no static pressure. Like if you turn the um, compressor off, all the air will just poof, leak right back out. This guy, um, the air can't, or it only leaks very, very slowly through these very small gaps, so it can maintain a high uh, static head pressure. Um, you might, you blow the casing or trip the motor. Hopefully you'll trip the motor before um, you get much leak back. And if you can apply a brake, it might maintain some pressure here at the outlet for a reasonable period of time. Rotary low blower, screw compressor, a similar device. Just way more complicated than just taking a simple cross section. Um, high high pressure devices. All right, good turbines and compressors. Now we just trip out of that and come back into the loop. What are we done? Good. Uh, turbines will have a positive work term. You get work out of a turbine. Compressors will have a negative work term. You put work into a turbine. Uh, if they're insulated, then you can get rid of the Q term for our purposes. So we say, well, the heat loss is either non-existent or negligible. Uh, no Q term. And you just get work is the mass flow rate times by the difference in enthalpies. So... Um, if, you are if your turbine isn't insulated, okay, then the amount of work you get out is reduced by whatever heat you've lost. So if you were going to get 250 megawatt, but you're losing 10 megawatt of heat, you get 240 megawatt as work and 10 megawatt lost as heat. Um, compressors are a funny one depending on what you use them for. If you want your gas to be hot at the end, insulate your compressor so that you don't lose heat. Um, and so that would be the case if you're compressing into a combustion chamber and then um, going through a turbine, like in an aircraft, you want that to be insulated, you don't want to lose heat. If you were compressing to go into a car cylinder, though, right, you might have not one compressor, but two compressors, and in between them you would have an intercooler, right, so you're deliberately taking heat out to increase the air density. Um, and so in that case, don't insulate your compressors. You want the heat to be, um, to be lost to the environment. So, we should answer a question. How much power is produced from a turbine? So this is a turbine question. Um, what are the knowns and what's the table? If I click through, topic 41, let's go. Week four, topic 41. Cool. All right, I transcribed the values because no one likes watching someone write down lots of values. Oh, let's go to something black. So, 50 bar is... 50 bar is not 50 megapascals. 50 bar is 5.0 megapascals. 
Wow. <clears throat> you see how accurately I transcribed the values. Right here, 5 megapascals, uh, 2.1 megapascal. We're told the temperature in, we're told it's isentropic, and we're given a flow rate in tons per hour, which I've converted to kilograms per second, by times by 1,000 and dividing by uh, 3,600. Cool. We can go to our superheated steam tables. If the temperature is above 374, you know it's superheated steam because it's above critical. Um, and we read across and we have an enthalpy value, an initial enthalpy value, and we know that our work for our turbine is going to equal m dot h1 minus h2. Okay, so we've got one of our enthalpy values. We need our other enthalpy value. So what's next? The next thing we need to do is exploit this fact, the fact that the enthalpy doesn't change, and look for that enthalpy on a table that shows us this pressure. So we say at 0.1 megapascal and 7.25 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin enthalpy, is it saturated vapor, is it superheated steam, or is it um, a compressed liquid? <sighs> I have those here. That's temperature related. Temperatures. This is pressures. It was 0.1 megapascal and 7. Point, yep, 7.25. So I'm looking along here. 7.25 is going to be it's greater than 1.3 and less than 7.36, right? So it's going to be a saturated mixture at this pressure. And those are the values. So this is going to tell us our quality, okay? So to determine quality, we can get the value that we have. So 7.25 minus 1.3 divided by 7.36 minus 1.3. And that will give us our quality x. So that's the next step. Sure. Let's have a look. <coughs> X equals. That subtraction is done for you in the tables, of course, with S, F, G. Equals. <coughs> I apologize for my eights. I'm left-handed. It's a good excuse for most things. So it's very high quality steam. So it's, um, it's quite pushed over onto the right-hand side, uh, which is good, so it probably won't damage our turbine, which is um, excellent, although out of the scope for the course. So now the question becomes, well, what's the enthalpy value then? So what's our H2 value? And it will be our quality X, times by our HFG plus our H, oops, that's an F, plus our HF at that pressure. So we come across here and we say these are our H's, HF 417.4, HFG 2258.1, Because I'm looking down, if I do something untoward, or you don't understand, five, eight, point one. let me know. So this is going to be our enthalpy at the exit of the turbine, equals... So now we've got our enthalpy at the exit, 2640. And we've got our enthalpy at the entrance, 3666.5. So then the work equals, oh, this is power, it's differential respect to time, 83.3 repeater times by. Three. 
3666.5 minus 2637.8 equals And who's doing the calculation? Who's going to get there? Oh, I'm glad I said that. No one's calculating. <coughs> I get something starting with an eight. Good. Eighty-five point seven megawatt. So this is a. I don't know whether you've heard about the specifications for power plants. Two hundred and fifty megawatt power plant, five hundred megawatt power plant. This would be a eighty megawatt turbine. So a single turbine within the within the facility would be giving eighty megawatt. Okay. Simple calculation, just based on energy in and energy out. We're using enthalpy because there's a pressure volume component to the work um, that's worth taking note of. And so that's our energy out of the system. We'll continue on. We'll talk about pumps. We'll do the pump question and then we'll take a break. Um, so pumps, this is a centripetal pump. Uh, it's shown down the bottom. It looks similar to a compressor. Um, and it is similar to a compressor in some senses. This is a photo of a um, centripetal pump. This pump is, sorry? No, good, good, that's fine. Um, this pump is moving fluid, this pump's moving water between a fluid bed cooler and a fin fan cooler, which I'll talk about uh, later. Um, is there anything there that's giving you a sense of size or scale? Anyway, the pump's about, you know, maybe, maybe two metres long from the very end. Um, so from that all the way through to the impeller would be about two metres long. Um, on a process flow diagram or um, process instrumentation diagram, PNID, you might see it denoted by anything that's on the right. Okay, flow goes in the direction of the arrow. Um, there's different types, like I said, gear pumps, so positive displacement, um, rotary and so forth. Pumps like turbines have a negative work term, you put work into them and we're trying to raise the pressure. Temperature we'll find won't rise considerably unless it's an ineff a very inefficient pump. Um, and typically we would insulate if we want to maintain temperature. And so we get a term that looks very similar to the term we had before. Work is mass flow rate times difference in enthalpies. Yeah. Uh, I swapped the enthalpy terms around. So H1 and H2. Oh. Uh-oh. Because um, I'm bad with negatives? Because I swapped the enthalpy terms. Oh, the, the written example? Uh-oh. Is there a negative term? Nope. Go away. Nope. Work equals mass flow rate. Difference in enthalpy is H1 listed first. Because I flipped the because I flipped the enthalpy terms. Um, yeah, I think it works. Someone tells me it doesn't work. I'm shocking. So Minuses are not my strong point, so I calculate the um, me. You, you shouldn't do this. No, you shouldn't. Um, I calculate, calculate the magnitude of the term and then say, am I putting the work in or out? And I give it a plus or minus respectively. Um, that's how loose I am. <laughs> but anyway, so what do Enthalpies for compressed liquids. Um, and the first example, the example I showed at the start, when we compressed something from like seven and a half kilopascals to five megapascals, and the enthalpy changed by like five kilojoules per kilogram, right? So enthalpy doesn't change very much 
for large changes in pressure. Um, I won't go into the theory, but you can look it up. Reissel doesn't cover it, but Sengel and Bowles covers why this is true. Um, but the work for a pump can also be the volumetric flow rate times by the difference in pressures. And this comes from work being the integral of PDV, and then you manipulate some crazy stuff, and then it's also the integral of VDP, which for a constant volume is the difference in pressures. I'm going to rub that out because I'm not confident with it. But uh, if you are more comfortable using this, you can use volumetric flow rate times the difference in pressures. We'll do the next calculation both ways and see that the difference isn't that significant. <laughs> um, I think the bottom term is more intuitive because um, it actually deals with what I consider to be real things, things you can touch, how much flow, um, liquid is flowing and what change of pressures am I giving it. Um, but uh, the top one's more consistent with the formulas we use for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the shaft work machines. So the question then becomes, we're raising fluid between the same pressures, but now it is a compressed liquid instead. Um, it's a saturated liquid at state three, and we're going to take it up to state four. So let's come back here. I'm, so turbine was one and two. This one's three and four. That's because that's how they're labeled in a cycle. So the first thing we would do is look at the H of a fluid at 0 0.1 MPa. Let's have a look at that. Can we see it? 0 0.1 MPa, HF is 417.3. Oop, that's UF, doesn't matter. HF's not very different than that. 417.4. 417.4. Okay. And then the question is, what's the H at, what's the pressure? 5 MPa. 5 MPa. Temperature is, oh. Sorry, I should have said, as a saturated fluid, we can also get the temperature. Is the only point one across the year? 99.6? Is that true? Oh, good, good. So the temperature is 99.6 degrees C. So then the question is, temperature 100 degrees C, and pressure of five megapascals, what's the enthalpy there? Because that's our final state. And we're doing a mass flow rate between our states. Good, come back across. We want a compressed liquid. Ah. Oh. This is the ebook version of Reisel. Going through the saturated steam, uh, superheated steam tables. Oop, too far. Where's the back button? Go back. Back, I say. Compressed liquid water, five megapascals, 100 degrees C. So the enthalpy is 422.7. Sorry about that, I just want to show you that 422.7, this is kilojoules per kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram, okay. The work of the pump is the mass flow rate times the difference in enthalpies. Now I'm feeling a little nervous about whether my H is the right way around or not. 83.3, repeater. 417.4 minus 422.7. So I get from that 442 kilowatt. 
So it's a 500 kilowatt pump. Okay? And so we can see we're getting a lot more out of the turbine than we're putting into the pump. And this is why we use steam power. Because you take electricity from the turbine, you use that electricity to run the pump, and voila, you're getting a lot more. And then the excess electricity you push out to the grid. You don't get that energy for free. We need to put that energy in as thermal energy somewhere else. Um, and we want to talk about that as well. The alternative way of doing, the alternative calculation here is work equals V dot difference in pressures. Uh, my apologies, there is a minus there. See? Um, P2 minus P1, which is the, you can get the volumetric flow rate from the mass flow rate times by the specific volume. And pressure one was zero point. Actually, these should be kilopascals. So it should be 100 minus. You can read the specific volume from the tables. I think it was 0 0.00104 something. Um, and you get 426 kilowatt with a negative. So you get a slightly different value. That will turn out to be negligent, uh, negligible in our overall calculation. So the difference between these to although it's, what is it, it's 20 kilowatt and 400, so that's 5% difference. 5% difference in the pump work, but when we're dealing with a system that's giving us megawatts of electricity, this then becomes a fraction of a percentage of, um, of difference. So when you look at overall work minus work, um, when we talk about thermal efficiency, this percentage which looks significant here will become insignificant, and either calculation is, um, is reasonable to do. So, any questions from that? Good, I'll just mention incompressible out. So we've got a compressible fluid work in, compressible fluid work out. We've got incompressible fluid work in. What about um, if we've got an incompressible fluid and we want to get work out of it, right? Well, we find from our last calculation that thermally we don't get much work out, okay? But kinetically, we can get quite a bit of work out. So if you've got a large potential difference, so like a dam, so a hydroelectric dam, there you're not exploiting thermal energy, you're exploiting potential energy and kinetic energy. You run it down a dam and you put it into, this is called the Pelton wheel, okay? The fluid is impacting on the inside and then being redirected back like that. And so this is then turning that way. Um, and we don't deal with them here because they're not thermodynamic devices, but you will deal with them in 2600 if you haven't already done so, and look at the maximum energy you can get out of um, a hydroelectric style power plant. That's shaft work machines. Let's take a break. Let's come back when the minute hand's pointing, I don't know, before the three. Just take a, just take a five minute break. Um, Jump up and stretch, and we'll try and do some other devices as well. <laughs>